Hi, good evening and welcome. Wherever you are in the world, and welcome tonight to our online conversation about Queen and St Margaret. It's a very fitting time to be having this the day after her anniversary and you're very warmly welcome to this conversation. My name is Margaret Curran. I'm a former Member of Parliament, a former Member of the Scottish Parliament, where when I was Minister for Parliament, I served along Sir Paul Grice, who is now the Principal of this University, and I very much appreciate the invitation to be here tonight. Uh, you will be excited too, I'm sure, when you know about our prestigious panel that we have with you. And I am delighted to welcome Sir Michael Penman, who is a med medieval historian from Stirling University, uh, Reverend Mary Ann Rennie from Dunfermline Abbey, and joining us, the Queen Margaret University's very own Paul Gilfillan, who is currently in Budapest at Cor Venus University, where he's doing a visiting fellowship. You know, Queen St Margaret is a very much loved figure in uh, Scottish life. And I remember as a child hearing many stories um, about uh, St Margaret, Queen Margaret, and perhaps I would argue I think she needs a bit more attention. So I think it's particularly appropriate that she's getting that attention, but she's getting it in this institution, Queen Margaret University. And this institution incorporated the name into for, for their use in 1972, because I think they believe that she represents the values of personal service, of ensuring that service is provided to all in the community. And I think it's very fitting that tonight that that's our focus. And I hope tonight gives us an opportunity to think about the relevance of Queen Margaret to modern Scotland and look at some of the history and you know, begin to understand perhaps and appreciate a bit more of the depth and richness of Scottish history so that it can be, uh, she can become more current in our conversations going forward. So I will ask our speakers to speak for 10 minutes each and I'll be very strict about that. <laughs> um, uh, and then we'll have some questions from yourselves, which if you use the chat function, it will, will give me the, an indication of the questions that you want to ask and I'll try and manage that as best I can and get responses from our speakers. So again, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I know that this will be a very interesting and uh, thought provoking conversation. So I will turn now to Dr Michael Penman. Talk to us. Thank you very much and thank you to QMU for your very kind invitation. I'm going to focus on the historical Margaret as exile, consort and a Christian exemplar and saint ultimately in the medieval period. Now to do that, uh, there is something of a source problem. We're reliant very much on hagiographical narratives, the writings particularly of English clergymen <coughs> that want to turn her into a saint or have an agenda about church reform uh, or about Scottish royal authority and are really beginning to deconstruct and reconstruct Margaret. But we can nonetheless and follow what is an, an important story. I think it's often quite striking that we have to first of all realise that Margaret isn't Scottish, just like Andrew. Uh, Margaret is an immigrant to Scotland, an Anglo-Saxon royal, a political refugee, an exile indeed, albeit an elite one. Her grandfather, Edmund Ironside, passes the right to the English title to Margaret's father, Edward the Exile, but they are displaced uh, by the Godwinson line. Uh, thus we find that Margaret is born and grows up in exile in southern Hungary. Incidentally, the seat of her residence uh, in Baranya, southern Hungary, has recently been recreated digitally, surrounded by churches, a number of which are now dedicated to St Margaret. But that means she's growing up in a kingdom which, a bit like Scotland, is going through an important transitory period, being forged into a single nation under one dynasty, as well as going through profound and important religious change and reform under uh, the legacy of King St Stephen, a royal saint for Hungary. Little wonder that Margaret and her sister uh, grow to be so pious. Her sister will be an abbess in England in the 1060s and 70s. But it's dynastic politics that drives much of her fate. She's back in England with her brother, who's perhaps seen as having a place in the Anglo-Saxon succession nonetheless by 1057. But of course, the Norman conquest brings that hope to an end. And by 1068, two years after the conquest, she's in exile again. It seems to be around this period that she first meets Malcolm of Scotland, Malcolm III of Scotland. He perhaps already knew her, and we should recognise that as much as a, 
a mutual attraction, love indeed. There is a strategy at work here. For Malcolm, here is a royal who might give him a claim to displace the Norman kings of England. She's the Anglo-Saxon claimant uh, for much of her life. Now, we come to what Turgo, Margaret's biographer, emphasises her, as her profound influence over her husband, calming a man who is, to all intents and purposes, a warlord who will regularly attack England right up until the end of his life. He <laughs> dies invading England in 1093. I think we have to recognise that Margaret may have played a hand in that. She is a political and dynastic figure as much as she's a spiritual one. Uh, and although Turgo emphasises her influence on Malcolm religiously, that she turns him to be quote, more attentive to justice, mercy and almsgiving, as well as acting as his consort and partner, giving him six sons and two daughters. She may have encouraged the invasions of 1072, 1093 as a way of laying claim to control northern England, perhaps a, an Anglo-Saxon enclave for her lost line. She certainly, though, influences him in bringing new reforms to the church. He founds Dunfermline, first of all, as a priory, uh, bringing in churchmen from Canterbury through Longfranc, Archbishop of Canterbury. We have their letters. Early Dunfermline has a scriptorium, something of a school, proto-university, if you will. But Turgo also emphasises her influence in confronting what he describes as the backward nature of the Celtic Scottish church. Now, I think it's important to recognise that this is undoubtedly an ex exaggeration. It's Turgo's aim as an English churchman to get new practices in place in the Scottish church. And the evidence actually points to Margaret being quite sympathetic and engaged with the existing Celtic church in Scotland. So as much as she's interested in new cults, new rituals, new processes, she's also interested in the old Scottish cults. For example, St Lawrence Kirk, you can see here in Perth, the relics of St Columba. It's all part of her intense religiousness. She is, above all, a great pious exemplar, I think, and that comes through in all the sources, not only those that seek to make her a saint, but later ones that dwell on earlier sources that are now lost to us. Her charity to the poor, above all, shines through. Uh, her gifts of food, money, clothing, even at times the shirt off Malcolm's back, none of which he contradicts or he goes along with it and engages with it as well. Uh, records of her washing the feet of the poor on particular feast days, for example, something she engages her husband and her children, particularly her sons, in doing. She donates a ferry for pilgrims on their way to St Andrews, of course, at Queen's Ferry. They can touch to her church dedicated to the Holy Trinity. Margaret as a focus for prayer and indeed the intensity of her own prayers is also worthy of note. And indeed, the objects of her veneration possessions that she, we know she had during her own life, become something of a, a series of national icons for the Scots through the 12th to the 14th centuries. So on the left here, you have the black wood or something similar to the black wood, a piece of the, the true cross, and Margaret's own gospel book, which still survives in the Bodleian in Oxford, uh, containing the Psalms and particular prayers that Margaret herself was interested in. St Margaret's Chapel in Edinburgh Castle underlines the importance of her veneration of the Virgin, Christocentric cults that were sweeping Europe at that time, uh, quite often displacing more homespun Celtic native saints, but that Margaret is still interested in the local and the native, and indeed in older saints that transcend borders between England and Scotland, is underlined by her interest and Malcolm's interest too in the cult of St Cuthbert at Durham Cathedral. We know they're both present at the laying of the foundation stone, of Durham Cathedral and the new shrine for St Cuthbert in 1093, a few months before Margaret Mar Malcolm is actually killed uh, invading Northern England again. Just a few days later, Margaret herself will die and we have detailed records again from Turgo of the intensity of her prayer at her deathbed, holding, clutching the black root. This obviously has a profound influence on her children, as does her burial in Dunfermline at that time. Her son David, in particular, once he becomes king in 1124, really takes up the baton, the race that she's, she's started. He founds Dunfermline as a full abbey, as well as many other monastic institutions. He, I think, begins to develop the cult of Margaret as a focus for worship in and of itself. Uh, he certainly establishes Dunfermline as a royal mausoleum, as well as a cult centre. And it's from his period onwards that we can also trace evidence for the miracles of St Margaret. We have a late Spanish manuscript which contains 13th century Scottish records, probably written at Dunfermline, in the course of gathering evidence to have Margaret officially canonised by the papacy. She'll be Scotland's only 
officially canonised saint by 1249. The evidence of this material shows us that she's popular with women, perhaps far more so than many other cults of the day, as well as with ordinary subjects, particularly Scots, but also English. And she's curing and helping in particular cases of prayer for intercession, uh, things like paralysis, ailments to do with eyesight, not interestingly any miracles that are recorded to do with pregnancy and motherhood as you might expect others to do with helping scotland in battle uh she appears just before the battle of largs for example followed by three knights in armor three royal knights in armor uh, but from this document which was only really discovered and edited about 2000 uh, we also know of the miracle of a translation her first translation to a new shrine in 1180 when her body refuses to move unless the remains of her husband malcolm go with her. He too will be regarded as the same. She's officially translated to her last shrine in 1251, 19th of June 1251, uh, and that becomes a focus of worship along with her head shrine, her birthing shirt, a shirt she said to have worn giving birth to her royal children, later queens of Scotland will also wear this, and her earlier graves become sites of veneration with reports of pilgrims making vigils at all of these stations and Dunfermline as a great Abbey church. This has been the focus of some recent research, which I've been lucky enough to be involved in through the auspices of the Abbey church, uh, scanning for site of the remains of the royal tombs and of Margaret's shrine and other fittings in the church. That's allowed us to really recreate Dunfermline Abbey as, yes, the equivalent of Scotland's Westminster. Westminster, all the royal burials of the Plantagenet House focused around St Edward the Confessor, their former king, Margaret is Scotland's royal saint with a great cult centre and a church dedicated to the Trinity with great altars to St John the Baptist and the Virgin as well. That remains the case right up until the Reformation. Margaret's cult remains an important regional and national one until the destruction of 1560. Her relics, or at least some of them, are rescued however by fleeing monks and end up in Philip II's great relic collection at the Escorial in Madrid, uh, where they provide some inspiration for the revived Catholic community in Scotland from the 19th century onwards. Some of the relics have even returned uh, from Catholic sites associated with Scotland on the continent, like the Scots colleges. But interestingly, just to finish, uh, she remained an important figure in Scotland post-Reformation amongst the new Protestant Presbyterian churches of Scotland. I think perhaps controversially being being played to as almost a proto-Presbyterian, that her spirituality was pure and simple enough for Presbyterian churches to embrace too. So just like Columba, Mungo and others, you can find Protestant churches dedicated to St Margaret. And you only have to look at perhaps the evidence of things like stained glass to see her continuing presence through the 19th and early 20th centuries in Scotland. I'll stop there. Wow, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. That was fascinating. A Catholic saint and a proto-Presbyterian. Uh, that's Scotland for you. Um, <laughs> and a political and dynamic, uh, dynastic figure of great importance. Um, lots to talk about there. I'm sure lots of questions too. But I will move on now and introduce to you again, um, Reverend Mary Ann Rennie from Dunfermline Abbey. Again, a very important prestigious position in Scotland. <laughs> Delighted to have you here. Thank you. No, it's a, 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 yes, it's, it's, a, it's a great place to be a minister. I'm going to um, share a little bit about being shaped by a name, whether Margaret's shaped by names or whether we are shaped by her name. If um, you've never been to Dunfermline, by the very least by the end of what you hear, I hope that you'll discover that it's worth a visit. It's difficult to ignore Margaret of Scotland's influence upon the town. There are two churches named after her, one Roman Catholic and the Church of Scotland. The Episcopal Church has taken the name of St Margaret's Church, the Holy Trinity, and there are various sites that can still be visited that don't include Dunfermline Abbey the cave, Malcolm's Tower, and a relic of the saint. Within the 12th century nave, within the 12th century nave, her remembered presence and her original church are encased within the walls. Even the 19th century building is shaped by Margaret. Internally, there are plaster bosses of her face and a 1932 window which offers a pictorial representation of how Margaret should be understood within the history of Scotland. The shape and the length of the building allows for the remnants of St Margaret's shrine to be outside, and that's either because the Protestant building didn't want to host a saint within or to allow the Roman Catholic Church and others 
easy access to something that was significant to them. The tower might bear Robert the Bruce's name and he may or may not be buried under the pulpit, but he's only there because of St Margaret and it's her name that draws him to Dunfermline. He recognises something within her name that supports his life, the life of his family and his claims upon the throne. Naming Ma Margaret's saintly virtue is he seeking healing and forgiveness, clothing his consort in Margaret's birthing sark to ensure safe birthing of his own children, burying himself amongst Margaret's dynasty to legitimise the succession of a royal family. I'm not sure that recognising names as holding power is a common understanding today. Instead, that's relegated to something that the religious do. But for some, there's an unconscious recognition that names can place meaning on our lives. Our own names are imbued with meaning for those who choose them for us. The concept that naming something or someone as a means of power, though, is something that occurs in numerous cultures, including Christian traditions. Lauren Graham, a science historian, writes that naming something or someone is seen as the exertion of dominion over that thing or person. He cites the story of Rumpelstiltskin and notices that the miller's daughter is helpless to the power of the dwarf until she can name him and then she's in control. And sociologist Cathy Sharmas wrote, names provide ways of knowing and being. Names construct and reify human bonds and social divisions. We attach value to some names and dismiss others. This evening's conversation invites us to name St Margaret of Scotland so that we can better understand how her story and life, her name, has relevance in a contemporary context. It allows us to notice the names that shaped her. A woman of a medieval period, Margaret's life is shaped by men. And while Turgo, Margaret's confessor and hagiographer, and history bestows Margaret with agency and purpose, we are aware that ensuring royal lineages and peaceful borders relied upon appropriate marriages. Princesses were political bargaining pieces. The Turgo of Durham's hagiography had an intended original audience, Margaret's daughter Edith or Matilda. Because of that, he presents an inspiring figure of a woman and queen, a woman inspired by other women. Although critical of Margaret's penchant for the luxuries of court life, Targo offers an Old Testament example where another queen conformed to expectations of royal dignity. And he says, for when she walked in state, clad in splendid apparel and became a queen, like another Esther, she in her heart trod all these trappings beneath her feet and bore in mind that under the gems and gold there was nothing but dust to dash. Beyond the royal trappings, the biblical Esther is an outsider to the community into which she'd married, a second wife. In understanding Margaret, she offers an example of queenship that was virtuous, obedient, pious and effective, unafraid to speak about the concerns of those for whom she cared. The hagiographer and those who chronicled Margaret's life offered the Virgin Mary as a model for a queen who could become saint. In a PhD thesis, Politics and Sainthood, Claire Harrell suggests that aligning Margaret with the Virgin Mary allowed her to be noticed and valued without disrupting the patriarchal authority mm -hmm. of church and crown. But association with the, very, with the Virgin Mary also imbued Margaret with the qualities of kingmaker and royal mother. Margaret's gospel book provides two further female biblical figures, which Margaret herself must have focused upon in prayer and study. Contained within the pages are the story of Martha and her sister Mary, who offer images of service and devotion, two sides of religious piety. Those who've chronicled Margaret's life and historians have named other women who are thought to have influenced Margaret, offering parallels or opposing patterns. St Emma of Normandy and St Margaret of Antioch, to name only two. In using these names of female figures, Margaret is connected to the strength of the activities of these women so that her name is empowered with their qualities. Her name is imbued with the commitment to a life of royal service, a dedication to the raising and education of her family, the loyal support of her husband, her interest and care in people and making space for religious devotion. Now, I'm going to have to be honest and say that if I were not the Minister of Dunfermline Abbey, then I'm not sure how much I would know about St Margaret of Scotland. 
Rather than ignore her in our church life, we've opted to look at what elements of her named activities might shape our purposes. As a Christian community, we recognise the presence of Christ in her life. And our development plan, how we relate to our different communities, notices the strands of worship, piety, education, service to others, and a place for the outsiders. As areas of Margaret's life where Christ's story is revealed and named. If Margaret's name empowers church reform in different guises, then it also empowers understandings of womanhood. Some of the St Margaret's Chapel Guild are participating this evening, and I'm grateful to Sarah James for taking time to chat with me about the Guild. For those unfamiliar with the St Margaret's Chapel Guild, founded in 1942, its most recent constitution states its purpose as to promote the knowledge and understanding of the life and works of St Margaret of Scotland and to allow our example in relation to supporting family life, piety, religious education, care of church buildings and tolerance amongst religious groups. The 200 members plus are all named Margaret, either as a first or a second name. And one of their acts of naming Margaret within their lives is placing flowers within the St Margaret Chapel each week. For those who take up this role, it offers a private moment of reflection. But it's not just Margaret's moments of piety that shape these women. Like Margaret, they're feisty. That's said with genuine affection because I know some of them. <laughs> There were strident opinions shared in the updating of their constitution, not least over the use of the word pious and its connotation in a contemporary context. In Margaret's name, they share support and encouragement for one another across generations. St Margaret offers a strong model for women and in a diverse gender context for parenting and for family life. She seems to have kept her children close to her, not fostering them out for instruction elsewhere, but personally participating in their learning. Catherine Keane says this strong connection to family is further indicated by the observation that Margaret's children continued to be a source of long support and providential recourse to each other long after their mother's death. If we are naming St Margaret of Scotland as significant in our understanding of ourselves, then we have an exploration of expanded familial ties that offers supportive networks that bring a sense of belonging beyond traditional models of family. In suggesting that using the name of St Margaret of Scotland allows us a better understanding of her life and how individuals might respond to her name, I want to close by suggesting that if there is a resurgence in the exploration of saints' lives and the implication for contemporary Scotland, then there are three specific areas with Margaret's life that are important for shaping a kingdom. We should notice first that Margaret was an outsider, maybe even a refugee, who's welcomed and offered an opportunity to contribute to the shaping of the new context in which she was placed. Her stories are a reminder of the importance of those who are different to us, of working alongside them and valuing their contribution because they open the horizons of a future we are struggling to see. Then we should recognise the value she places on education, ensuring that others have an opportunity to learn, offers them the best outcome for their own lives and it allows them to participate in decision making in the present and the future. And finally, she represents what it is to support others in their achievements. To Malcolm's buoyant leadership, she contributes conciliatory diplomacy. We could say that she's the power behind the throne, but Margaret's life recognises that a vibrant community is best served by the recognition of complementary talents. I feel the scrub shoes round the floor, but this virtual <laughs> environment doesn't allow for that. That no, was fascinating. <laughs> Thank you so much. You. Full of tremendous insights. And again, I'm sure we'll generate much questioning. And it makes me very proud to be the called Mark. Thanks. <laughs> Lots in that, particularly that presentation at the end. We'll come back to that. Thank you very much indeed. Um,
Now let me turn to Budapest and welcome Queen Margaret University's very own Dr Paul Gilfillan. Again, I'm sure with much food for thought. Thank you, Margaret. So um, my presentation is going to be in my capacity as a sociologist uh, and certainly not an historian. So I want to make a purely secular sociological case as to why Margaret should have a special place in the Scottish University context today in particular. So I'm going to make my argument under five headings. My first heading is nation. Second, my second um, heading is history and culture. My third heading is knowledge. My fourth heading is modernity. And then finally, I'm going to make a case for Margaret's relevance under the topic of human authenticity. So my first heading is nation. As a result of the advent of material affluence to the general population from the 1970s onwards, truly new possibilities have opened up for the lives of the Scottish population. One possibility that has already become a reality is a post-British and a post-class politics, which have literally become affordable from the 1970s onwards. A politics of national identity has replaced a class-based politics because the basic material questions that dominated politics have come to an end and have been replaced by a politics of national identity. So we now have a new centre of gravity, more or less dominating our life as a national political community, the Holyrood Parliament. Thanks to material affluence, we have mobilised a cultural patrimony. We have resurrected medieval institutions and, in a sense, have seen the end of British history. This mobilisation and retrieval of what might be described as some of our deepest cultural memories, patrimony and institutions, doesn't necessarily mean Margaret is automatically or directly relevant to us today, but because it tears open a door that was nailed shut for centuries, the present devolution era more or less forces a path to historical figures such as Margaret. My second heading in culture. In 1980, the historian Marinelle Ash published her book, The Strange Death of Scottish History. Some 40 years later, no historian, of course, could write such a book as that today, after the return of what might be described as purely Scottish history because we today are living through this return of Scottish history. This relocation of history to within our national borders also hugely informs Scottish historiography. The end of a certain Whig or Unionist historiography is now more or less guaranteed. I don't have time to develop this point in 10 minutes, but as an example, I would just cite some of the work coming from Stirling University today. We've already heard from Michael, but I'm also thinking about people like Kelsey Williams and their material and what they call the first Scottish Enlightenment, which I think is set to revolutionise our understanding of ourselves as a nation. So the generation of Scots historians, such as Norman Stone, whom I mentioned, I mentioned Norman because I have recently learned that he's buried out here in Budapest, and whose disdain for Scottish nationalism as a, and quote, a lot of provincial nonsense, is itself now seen as horribly parochial and time bound, but more importantly, obsolete. So if we have the study of history being enervated by political power in the devolution era, the same is happening to the area of Scottish culture. We see the end of a long history of cultural repression and enforced inferiority. I will merely mention in this regard, um, as of 2020 in the Western Isles, children being taught through the medium of Gaelic. So we are already seeing the return of the culturally repressed. And as Michael hinted at a little bit, the politicisation of culture. And again, Margaret is the wife of King Malcolm III, a multilingual spoke Gaelic, as it was, among others, the language of the Scottish court again shows Mar Margaret as in the thick of it, as a direct link to contemporary debates and policies regarding language and culture in Scotland today. My third heading 
regards Margaret's relevance for knowledge. Um, I would propose another consequence of the advent of material affluence to an entire population is that the Enlightenment story or legacy dropped dead from the 1990s onwards. So that today we need a new knowledge ideal. And I would propose Margaret is particularly relevant here. So let me try to explain that, that, that assertion. The dominant story among elites and producers of knowledge in the West for the past 200 years is that of enlightenment. And from the 1970s onwards, this story of enlightenment triumphed, not only among social elites, but among the general population, as it finally reached the working classes. This story of enlightenment, this myth, defeated all comers. As a consequence, however, it has dropped dead among the children of those among whom the Enlightenment narrative of secularization secured a recent total victory. Because in thoroughly secular from birth and in thoroughly enlightened from birth generations, the Enlightenment story faced a problem it had never had to face before, how to reproduce itself in conditions of total victory. So my argument is this, among affluent since birth, and secular since birth generations. The enlightenment knowledge or ideal or myth, by which I mean the movement from superstition to reason at a certain point in history, has a new hoop to jump through. It now has to be personally existentially verified. For the first time ever, the enlightenment myth can no longer be reproduced socially, i.e. as a matter of convention or authority or collective belief or goodwill or as a matter of hegemony because the power of the social, the collective, the grip of the group upon the individual has died because their parents, their culture and education are enlightened. These are generations who are born skeptical of belief systems and meta narratives and the first victim of what might be called the democratization of enlightenment skepticism is not Christianity, of course, because that enemy of reason, um, I should put that in, in, uh, in commas, that enemy of reason was dead by the 1970s. So the new um, victim is the enlightenment myth itself. What has all this got to do with QMU? Well, the prospect of the destruction of the enlightenment myth should set off alarm bells at a university as it means every September we have a cohort of students um, who are headed for a radical nihilism if institutions of higher learning can't articulate a successor myth to the Enlightenment. My fourth heading is modernity. An opening to the wisdoms of the pre-Enlightenment era means opening to a fuller account of the different realities that exist and by implication, an opening to a fuller and more complex view as to what can be known. A kind of post rationalist recognition of the different kinds of knowledge that exist. And here there occurs once again, not just the opportunity to progress to something new in the future, but more or less the obligation for us today to see whether and where in our past there was an era that was free of any embarrassment at the existence of an investigation of multiple realities. And if there is such an era, then we are more or less compelled to remake and refashion contact, it, contact with it today. So again, Margaret can serve as an example, and I would propose Margaret as a precursor, as the kind of embodiment of this fuller, um, non-embarrassed project. So Margaret has many titles. I would another title for Margaret, the mother of modernity. As the wife of Malcolm III and the mother of eight children, three of whom became successive kings of Scotland in the decisive 12th century, which, as historians argue, saw what's called the Davidian Revolution, Margaret can serve as an historical example of what sociologist Victor Branford called the first onset of a larger modernity, a complex modernity that we in post-devolution Scotland are called upon to resume. 
Finally, my fifth area where I will argue Margaret is of special relevance to us today is the question of human authenticity. As you might expect of me by now, I'm going to argue another consequence and opportunity that comes with material affluence is the obligation to be an individual. More and more, we're able to secede from the group. It's not just that we enjoy the freedom to choose our beliefs, values, or whether we want ancestors or traditions or not, but that, we, that, but that we are forced to choose from a bewildering set of choices. As adults today, we are simply unable to coast along happily in what might be called a community of fate. From the 1970s then, we see the explosion of what Charles Taylor called the ethics of authenticity, the explosion of the search for self-fulfillment. And so I would propose that Margaret can be a centre of gravity for such questions and that we as an institution of higher learning can similarly be a centre of gravity insofar as we pose this question and develop some kind of expertise in addressing it. So in conclusion then, the social function of saints is to incarnate a society's ideals, to act as icons for the socialisation of the next generation into a culture's highest aspirations for itself. So I propose we think of Margaret as a centre of gravity to ground these abstract questions of authenticity, this existential issue that has been released among post-affluent generations today. I propose that we as an institution of higher learning are more or less obliged to have some sort of an answer to these questions um, are obliged to allow ourselves to be plunged into this crisis because if we can face this crisis, then we can face the students that come through our doors every September. Ah, well, I did promise at the beginning that it was a prestigious panel and there would be very substantial contributions. And I think we have witnessed our final and again, very substantial contribution. I'm sure we'll be thinking about all of this in the weeks and months to come. And, uh, and thank you again for that, talking about Margaret as a mother of modernity as um, a new knowledge ideal and finishing on thinking through about the role that she can play in helping life at Queen Margaret University and of course I think more broadly in Scotland. Now can I encourage those of you out there across the world and in Scotland too who are watching this to put your questions on the chat function and we will I will put them to our panel tonight to make sure that your questions are answered. But as you are doing that, let me begin with a question and I'll ask each of our panel to briefly comment on that. And, you know, we've heard a lot about Margaret's um, image, about, the, about her story, the impact that she's had in Scotland and how she should be continually recognised, how she is being in some part continually recognised. But, and it picks up some of the things that Paul mentioned. Should we, as a collective in Scotland, in our different uh, walks of life, promote a wider focus on Margaret? Would society benefit from that if we uh, promoted her more assertively, um, particularly as a woman that Scotland, although an outsider, Scotland could and should be very proud of? Um, and what would be the value to wider society of a stronger promotion of Margaret? And how could that be done? Now, Michael, you've had a rest for a while, oh, so yeah. I'm going to turn back to you because Paul might need to catch his breath. Um, so can you just give us some insight into that? Sure, I, I, mean, I certainly feel the least qualified to, to answer that one on the panel. I think part of what we teach at Sterling is actually a course called Reputations, in which we look at usable icons of Scotland's past. And Margaret's one of the figures we do include. And I think there's no question that for successive generations of Scots, almost from the moment that she passes, perhaps even in her own lifetime, but certainly through the medieval period, even post-Reformation, and again, more intensively in the 19th and 20th centuries on, she's usable. For me as a historian, there's the recognition that unavoidably a lot of that means that she's a construct. To use mm -hmm. Paul's language, she's being remade and recast, and that maybe detaches itself somewhat from the historical reality as close or as, or as vaguely as you can ever know that. And I suppose for me, that's a bit of, bit of a tension and I begin to wonder, and certainly when we discuss Margaret with the students, you do get questions like, well, 
or you ask them questions like, does she appeal to you now? And what stands in the way can be a variety of, no, she's an establishment figure. She's an elite figure. She's a queen. Uh, they can't quite see the connection between her and the ordinary, her and the, the wider community. Or no, it's the religious aspect that stands in the way. Uh, or no, it's the nationalist aspect, which, although for me, that's the, the one that's the most blurred here. Uh, as a historian, I can say, well, she's a dynast. She's, 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 she's an Anglo-Saxon royal. That, that's going to be playing on her. I tried to get them to think about how she might not have stood for many of the things that we now think she can you stand for. Setting up for your post now, I think. Yeah. Post that, I well, think. It, it, I suppose it boils down. If you want to use her as a modern icon, I think Paul makes a very compelling case. But I suppose I'm slightly more drawn to Anne Marie's take, and that there may be only some elements of her that you could and should pluck out. Otherwise, you are constructing something maybe somewhat artificially, and she maybe can't hold it up in a way that a figure like, say, Wallace could. Mm. Although even there, there's a huge construct yes, going on. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that the motherhood, maternity side, the community side, and that allows you to transcend some of the other things to do with class. Is she an establishment figure? Is she purely a Catholic figure? And so on. Mm. Uh, she's very interesting. I mean, I, I find her far more interesting to discuss along these lines than someone yeah. like Wallace. I have to say. Right, good. There's so, so much we could follow up in that. Can I just cut across you slightly, Marianne, because there's a question that's come in that I think takes us just further down that conversation. And uh, and many are uh, many of the questioners are thanking all of you for such informative discussions. Um, but this is from Leslie Milton. Um, I'm struck by the stories told of how Margaret was involved both in conflict, but also as someone who in her own history legend is able to bridge difference. Um, what does the figure of Margaret have to say to us about an inclusive Scotland? And you were beginning, I think, to edge us towards that. So that idea of assuming that that's something we value in Scotland today. Yeah, that may be an assumption. Yeah, but on that basis, it, it's mm -hmm. really interesting because I was I was finding finding a fine line of giving away my politics, being very, yeah. very careful on that. Um, I think I think in a contemporary Scotland, um, she does open that that doorway to recognising that that. Um, Scotland has always been a place that welcomed outsiders and valued outsiders and that we see that in her. I, I, I don't think we can ignore the fact that she ends up here because she's a queen and therefore perhaps is um, offered opportunities that others aren't mm -hmm. and, and there's no way because because everybody else is hidden you know she, mm -hmm. the very fact she has a name tells you that she she had a prominence so we don't know how what was the rest of Scotland like that? Could you, mm -hmm. could an outsider come in and be welcomed? But if what you grasp from her story is actually in our tradition, there is the welcome of the outsider and the valuing of what they bring to to the community um, that enhances that in, in supportive relationships and um, brings reform, perhaps necessary reform, some reforms uncomfortable, there will be those who disagree with the kind of reforms that she did bring, um, but there's this really core element of outsiders, maybe not something to be feared, they bring something of value, something worthwhile and something we need to listen to. Highly contemporary, highly relevant. Paul, um, does some of this debate about inclusion still fit within your analysis? Can we use Margaret as, um, you know, as a modern value of inclusion? Is that part of what we can think through? I, I certainly think, Margaret, the one of the really interesting things about the time that Margaret lived was that there, in many ways there was this tremendous kind of seismic or possibilities as to which direction Scotland would go. And Michael has already mentioned, uh, referred to Margaret's father you know, passed over, if you like, because of the Norman uh, Norman invasion. Now, in terms of it, I would see Margaret at the centre of these shifts that goes on. Now, I would see that Scotland today is also at a kind of turning point as to where, you know, which direction it takes. So just as in Margaret's time, there was this decisive period as to you know, Scotland was changing into a kind of modern European nation and it was moving away from being a, a, a Gaelic speaking um, and clan based society. So you have that wonderful tension that's, that's ongoing. So rather than looking to Margaret as for a set of solutions, I, I would think that 
it's really interesting to look at Margaret is immersed in that whole, um, you know, that, that wonderful, rich um, choice that Scotland has to make. And likewise, of course, we today are in the same kind of situation. Um, you know, Mary Ann's mentioning about the collection of inclusion, inclusivity, etc. So again, you know, all the time we're faced with these fundamental questions as to what direction the country moves in. So again, not looking at Margaret for solutions, but she also lived with this tension as to, you know, um, which way to turn, which way to, um, what kind of Scotland do we live in? These questions, um, you know, were separated from Margaret by centuries, but the same fundamental questions of where do we go as a political nation, as a community, as a culture, you know, we still have to um, um, ask and answer these questions today. Yeah, thank you very much. Can I move on now to another question from Sarah James from the Isle of Mull? You're very welcome. Um, what do the speakers think is St Margaret's greatest achievement? I'll start with you and Kate, so I'm not always coming first to you. <laughs> Sorry, Marianne, throwing you. <laughs> I think probably her ability to um, create a family that actually goes on to provide good leadership. I mean, there's this, there is this un, unsettled period as the, as, they trans, as, as the different sons line up to take their role. But once we get to David, there's this, this nice, settled, steady um, period of history um, that you think she, she's able to create this family that um, values one another um, and then then is also able to sh to value the communities that they're serving. Um, I think that would be, you know, I think I could just abuse my position yeah. slightly. I think that's a very interesting point. But what I was thinking through all of this mm -hmm. is perhaps she's not at the prominence because she's a woman and perhaps we don't value the history of women enough, but also your emphasis on perhaps we don't value, you know, the nurturing of family, you know, the support of family. That's mm -hmm. not been, you know, a dimension of history we've really particularly explored. I mean, I want, it's interesting to emphasise yeah, that. I want to pick up on, slightly on something that Paul had said, which was when he was talking about the, the change in 1990. And what I was trying to get at, at the end is this power behind the throne is I think that we now live in a community, this individualism that we all, and, and, and you know, I would, I would accept that for myself, that we all think that we need to be the person at the front. And actually what, what we see in Margaret's life is sometimes the people behind are the people who offer the best leadership um, and you know it's the, the the power behind the throne and I I, I, so I think that, that she she tells us that society can't be individualistic that instead we do have to shape communal life through each other and in fact that that individuals um, don't create a community or a society mm -hmm. all they do is create conflict but by valuing um, what others bring and encouraging them because you see something within them. What a community we could create. Mm -hmm. Paul, what do you think St. Queen Margaret's? I think, actually, I think I would actually agree with Mary Ann. Margaret clearly was an exception, but um, thanks to having eight children, three sons, kings of Scotland that dominated the, uh, the 12th century. And, and that was huge. I, I, I find it difficult to get over her significance, you know, um, so in herself, but also some of her eight children. I mean, you know, um, thanks to that, you know, her legacy isn't just doesn't come to end with when she dies, but it lives on. Thank you. And Michael? I'd agree with all that. Yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting that recent scholarship for this period in Scottish history, there's more talk of the, the Margaret sons as the succeeding kings, not just the Malcolm sons. That's sort of oh, shorthand yeah, that's yeah, used yeah, for the Canmore yeah, dynasty. Yeah. So there is a recognition of her influence on them and the sort of defining pretty of David. Uh, but Alexander the first, Edgar, short as he is too. Uh, I think for me to, to, to tie some of these things together, I suppose you, you could boil down a lot of what Margaret does by becoming queen, remaining in what is essentially a political role and therefore going on to be a mother, mm -hmm. a consort, as well as a, an exemplar on so many you know, cultural religious fronts. She does maybe make a choice and to, to bring both Marianne and Paul's points together. That's very authentic. Whereas her sister, her younger sister, uh, is trained for the church and becomes an abbess, a very 
singular purpose, you could say, and, and shut away largely in a closed community. And Margaret's daughter, Edith, who becomes consort of Henry I, at first that's to be her training too, but then she makes the choice no, to come back in to this much fuller role, much more engaged role. Engagement, maybe, mm -hmm. a choice to make yeah, that engagement. Yeah. And actually you end up with a much more complex and authentic individual. Yeah. I quite like the sort of reading between the lines in Turgot that Turgot almost struggles to deal with the fact that Margaret clearly likes nice clothes and jewellery. <laughs> Uh, not just for decorating like the board board yeah, this conversation with not me. just for decorating the gospel. He says this is, this is fitting for her station and she puts up with it. No, she clearly likes a bit of blink. Uh, that's much more authentic that she, she knows the station of royalty, but also she will she'll wash the feet of the poor. I don't find any other medieval queen of Queen of Scots doing that. Uh, can so there is can I just pick you up on that yeah. with another question? Sure. Um, fascinating talks, everyone. I wondered how authoritative a source Turgo's account of St Margaret's life can be seen at all. You said it was a hagiography, mm -hmm. and you implied that, I think, in your I, I used the same word, yeah, yeah. So is it authoritative nonetheless, or is there something in it that's authoritative? Yes, I mean, yeah. he, he knew her, yeah. uh, and he's very close to David as well. There are natural biases as a result of that. He's an English churchman, he's from Durham. Uh, he doesn't succeed in the Scottish church office he's given at St Andrews, so he's, he's kind of a failure in imposing his own reforms. Mm -hmm. Therefore, is he using Margaret to retrospectively say, this is what we should have done. Oh, look, they've done it now, I was right. Yeah. So there's that side of it, but he knew her. So some of what he's talking about must be genuine, mm -hmm. perhaps quite a lot of it. Uh, you, you can read between the lines in Hagel, and there are moments, particularly when you, you get him talking about early miracles, early instances of engagement with particular religious sites, mm. cults and so on. I think that seems genuinely authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, one degree closer than the next great clerical source, which is Aylred of Revo from Yorkshire, who's closer to David, closer to her son and closer to um, Edith, uh, who's the wife of Henry I, it's David's sister, Margaret's daughter, that already they're beginning to remake her, mm. the great mother figure, the great parent of the nation kind of thing is already beginning to start. Uh, Turgo gives you glimpses of the much more at times flawed figure, perhaps trying to be an exemplar, but still making mistakes. It's quite interesting. Yeah. yeah. Maybe Anne, do you want to add anything? I wouldn't want to argue no, with Michael. No. Paul, do you want to argue with Michael? No. <laughs> no, much, much. Um, and uh, to what extent, and I think this one comes from the USA, um, to what extent do the visual images of St Margaret, although clearly not contemporary images, shape our view of her? Now, I do that think that's a really interesting, interesting question because obviously the images that I think you've mainly seen this evening are all of a very attractive Margaret. And therefore we have this image of um, somebody who's well fed and um, enjoys her finery, but actually there's a, there's a controversial painting at Durham um, of Margaret and David where she, and I can only describe her as a haggard old crone, <laughs> um, but um, somebody said to me last week about that picture that it, it perhaps is the, the picture that really depicts what years of fasting would have done to her. And so it, perhaps it offers a real representation of that the beauty may have lain within, not on the skin. Yep. Um, and I think that there's a real power in that thought so that, yeah, and, and I do think that's why I say, yes, most of the modern representations are of this beautiful woman. And we're told that she's beautiful, but beauty isn't always. Yeah. Interestingly enough, another uh, question has come in. Has anyone seen the painting of St Margaret with her son by Paula Rago, that's the it. Portuguese? Yes. Is that the one you're yes. referring to? Mm -hmm. It was um, one of the most striking images in the recent retrospective at the, at the Tate, uh, Tate Modern. And she's just portrayed as lean, strong, determined, mm -hmm. yet somehow vulnerable. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, is that the yes. one that you're... It's that yeah. one. That I, mm -hmm. I, they're, they're much kinder yeah. because I just found her, I, I found uh -huh. it quite... Um, an uncomfortable picture to look yeah, at. Yeah, perhaps we're not used to those mm -hmm. images though of, you know, queens being portrayed in that way. Now, um, I, I was going to add just one point. I remember vividly, I made reference to this earlier when I was very young, I mean, many, many, many years ago. Um, I mean, it was about six or seven, being taught uh, regularly about St Margaret, it would, the emphasis was on, but also Queen Margaret. And one of her contributions was that she not only 
promoted service to the community, which is part of this this university's founding mission, um, but also that it was particularly to the poor and the excluded in that community. Now, I think that's my my recollection of that. I don't know if that's a dimension that's particularly important of our work that she proactively moved the church and Malcolm to consider those who were. Would that be? I, I feel like I'm going to end up answering all the questions. Yes, but, the, but actually, yeah. I think in the, in terms of Dunfermline life, that probably the fact that she physically went out into the streets was probably very important. So and she did do that. Yes. Yeah. One mm -hmm. of the one of the descriptions of Dunfermline is that when the the um, when the abbey thrives, the town thrives, and so the the fact that there's this if there's a capacity for caregiving and supporting the poor coming from this religious centre, then the town around it began to thrive. So uh, the stories are that she went out to visit, to serve. And mm -hmm. I think, as Michael says, you have to believe that there must be an element well, of truth. She's with me through many, many years. Yeah. So it, uh, hopefully it's had some influence on my work. Um, I've now only got a few minutes left. Could I ask you um, briefly, I'll give you a minute each, to do this. Mm -hmm. Just to summarise, in, in my previous life as a politician, that key message, you know, short, brief, that people will remember, um, was drilled into us. What would be your key message about Queen Margaret, St Margaret, now that we're sitting in Queen Margaret University for to inspire students and Scots going forward? I'm not going to leave, you've just been speaking. Paul, I'll turn to you, you've had a, a wee rest. Well, as I said at the very start of my um, introduction, yeah, I think Margaret is a sociologist. Clearly, we can look at her in terms of a person from, from a faith perspective. But I think Margaret is a person that we can look to to ask that fundamental question. What role, if any, does the past play today? Um, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, the Scots, we, you know, we've just recently resurrected ourselves as a political nation once again. So automatically the, the past, you know, we didn't do that um, from nothing. Clearly we're relying upon our sense of ourselves that comes from the past. So I really do think, you know, just using Margaret as one example, clearly there are all kinds of people we could look at. But one of the things that I'm really grateful for for helping to bring this tonight's event around was for me to kind of seriously sit down and ask that question about what is the role of the past in today? And I absolutely take Michael's point. Sometimes I was kind of pushing the limit there in terms of one uh, constructing the Margaret that we need today. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, you know, that was fair comment, but, but I think, you know, it's, it's a people, you need memory, you need you need historical figures to kind of embody that memory, not just in terms of looking at the past, but anchoring us and giving, giving us some kind of anchorage for going forward. Mm -hmm. And Margaret does that, I think. Yeah, yeah, very helpful, thank you. Michael? Yes, I would, I would agree with that. I think, again, both, both Mary Ann and Paul have made really compelling cases that she is very usable still. I mean, mm -hmm. even if you were taking a purely practical viewpoint, when this institution was founded in 1875 as a, as a nursing or domestic economy college, Margaret had residence then. Now, I think the case has been very compelling to me that she has much more, much wider residence. Uh, I'm not averse to, to constructing an image. I think it, it, it's interesting that when we teach Margaret on the course I mentioned, there are moments when she can be seen as a British hero, even an imperialist hero. That's part of the, the ability to remake recast and so on. But I think it's what Paul touched on at the end, human authenticity, I think from mm -hmm. what we've talked about today, you know, you can peer behind the sources, you can peer behind the image being remade. There's still enough real power there, a real mm -hmm. achievement, real life mm -hmm. and a real individual, I think, that is authentic and can take you from someone who might be very pious to someone who's purely orientated uh, to, to, to serving. <laughs> well, not so much power, I mean, I think, you know, uh, she dies in her 40s. Mm. You know, it's quite a short life in some sense, some senses, and yet crammed full of stuff, it, it would obviously be. I, I, I think that the legacy, particularly to 
not just David, because I think a lot of what's achieved is even longer than that. I think that the, our grandsons, our very our great grandsons, are very much aware that this isn't finished yet. Uh, and even when Dunfermline is, is fully built as an abbey by the late 13th century, there's still more to do. So I think it, 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 it's a it's an unending mission, if you like, that she can be the icon of. Mm. Uh, I, I think both the other speakers have made a really compelling case that it's far broader than you might at first think. Yeah, I suppose I would say because we're here in the university, one of the things I think that should be valued of Margaret is her valuing of education, that she quite clearly has educated herself and, and then proceeds to educate other folk, that, um, that she sees that the best way to enable people to be them best se their best selves is to make sure that they pay attention to what's happening around them. Oh, very. On that note, I'm going to finish with a final comment that's come in. Um, and I'll just uh, quote this directly. Through the Queen Margaret University, the spirit and values of Queen Margaret has enabled me as a mature student to graduate 54 years old. I am now 77. So on that very positive note that confirms exactly what you've just said, um, can I draw the event to a conclusion and thank on your behalf our eminent speakers tonight who have been extraordinary and very stimulating food for thought. Um, as we were coming together at the beginning of this, we joked that what we really need in Scotland is a film about St Margaret, a blockbuster. So if any of you out there are bidding uh, producers or directors or have lots of money, perhaps you might want to think about that. But truly um, a very stimulating event. Can I thank you all on behalf of the university and behalf of our participants. Enjoy Budapest, Paul. And uh, I can, I of course, thank Queen Margaret University for thinking about having this event and delivering it for is truly very interesting. Thank you very much for your participation.